Hello, and welcome to My Career in Data, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Peter Burster from Northell. With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launchpad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DBTALKS for 20% off your purchase. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Data Diversity and this is My Career in Data, a Data Diversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management, to understand how they got there and to talk with people who help make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today, we are joined by Peter Verster, the Chief Exec at Northal and the author of AI for Business. And normally this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest, but in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. Peter, hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. Thank you for having me. Um, Delighted to be here. here. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So I can't wait to hear your story. So tell me, okay, so you're the chief exec at North Owl. So tell me what type of of business is North Owl? Yeah, so we're we're effectively a data company, but we have a bit of a USP in the fact that we we consult with businesses on the impact they want to create from their technology investments. And then we help them set off on that journey. We create the strategy for them and their roadmap. And then where we are unique is we then follow through with delivery of whatever those technical enablers are. And for the most part, as you well know, a lot of things pivot on data and how you use that to create and extract value. So we're effectively combining consulting with delivery and we do that in short cadences. So it really is effective when you implement the change as you go along. So we are slightly different in the two worlds being joined up, if that makes sense. And where's the company based out of? What And what demographic are you serving? Yes, yeah, so we're based out of the UK. Um, we have global aspirations. Um, we've got a few other people in Canada covering North America. So primarily covering those two markets. But historically, we're all UK based. All our clients have been in the UK. We come out of retail, um, a lot of retail workers where we started off. And as you can imagine, B2C, a lot of data in that space. And then I've also done some stuff with apparel manufacturers in Germany. And you can imagine who those are. So we've, we've got an international flavor to what we do. And there's a lot of airline businesses who have global footprints as well, but primarily we're based in the UK. And then the team is sort of spread around Europe a little bit. We have a work from home policy and we try and create a nice environment for people to work, work work-life balance. And so we have remote working as as a primary means of actually how we operate. So we've got people in Europe as well, but primarily UK and Europe based would be the sort of base of where we are. Nice. So as the chief executive, exec, what do you do? Um, sort of two roles really, I think, um, uh, the one is understanding the evolving landscape and keeping an eye on where the industry is moving, where the opportunities are, and really thinking about the future and where the box's going to be. And so we can position ourselves for that effectively. So a lot of research and networking with academics and sort of industry leaders to understand what's happening and how, how it's unfolding. And then my second role, which is then a continuum of that, is architecting the, the company and the team to then respond to those opportunities. So we are in the right place at the right time to help our clients and create value for them as well. So it's kind of those two sort of a cycle of one at a time, but continuously looking at both of those and responding to what's happening effectively so we can be future ready. Uh, Very nice. And so obviously you work with a lot of data, especially with your customers, but do you work with data in your own job and, and how do you work with data? Yeah, I mean, we use a lot of data for our own internals, um, just really simple things like optimizing our own processes. So looking at things that we track, we use lean as a, as a primary means of operating. And so how we track, you know, things in progress and look for bottlenecks and optimizing processes, which is really the primary way we use it. Clearly, there are other things we do with data. We learn a lot of new things. And so we have to digest a lot of information. So we use the popular tools you can imagine to help us synthesize some of the stuff down, summarize, maybe extract, combine. So we use it in that sort of context to help ourselves improve AI skills and our processes 
Um, it's a primary means of how we use it internally. Um, and that's kind of how we do. We, we focus on this continuous improvement cycle effectively, and that helps us a lot by doing data-led analysis and, and then plan our actions accordingly. Um, and then just upping our skills and knowledge knowledge development as a, as a primary means of keeping our skills relevant as well. So those are the two primary ways that we use it practically in day-to-day. -day. Oh, very cool. Uh, I love that you even have a methodology behind it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So in addition to your day job, you are also the author of AI for Business. So tell me about the book and, and how this came about. Yeah, so I think most people have a book in them, right? And I've been having one for many years. I think I've I've always gone around and helped companies and enabled them and sort of consulted and speak to a lot of people about their challenges and then helping them solve those or being exposed to a lot of common challenges. And what the book is really meant to do is not meant to cover the technical side of AI specifically, but it's basically help break the inertia of how do you get started? Because what I find a lot is people are looking at this thing and going, it's such a big space. Where do I even start, right? And then typically when they start, I see them starting on the wrong end of things. And so I'm like, well, you shouldn't really start there. So what I'm trying to, what I try to do with the book is design it for people who actually want to embark on the journey and trying to simplify it for them, making it digestible and understand the scope of all the stuff that you need to have to be successful with AI and specifically in data. So it's really to break the inertia. So the whole design around it was to simplify it, make it digestible and make it tangible. So mm -hmm. that's the three design things I put in it. So it's really not a lecture on AI at all. It's if you don't know where to start and you know that there's potential there, you may have heard some of the stuff, you've read some of the hype. How do you practically put that into your business so you can ask the right questions? Because in most cases you have to work with a team, maybe multiple vendors, you have to work with specialists what are the right questions and how do you get started is generally what the book's meant to do. Very nice. Um, so tell me, Peter, is this what you wanted to be when you grew up? Let's say like when you were six years old, did you dream like I'm going to be the chief exec at a consulting data company? No, not really. <laughs> um, what was the dream? <laughs> in engineering they were all various fields of engineering so i remember at six i think i, I called it electro electromechanical engineer that's what i wanted to be because i was raised in south africa and engineering is a really big thing in south africa because engineers build new things that's kind of how the country ah. has evolved to what it is yeah so my aspiration was to build new things um what i found myself is in software which is also building new things but it's incredibly flexible and very um, it has a lot of creative potential. You can really express yourself in that field. So how I ended up in that was just software engineering. That was my trade I picked, and that's what I went for. And as I got into working with larger clients and bigger projects, there was always a common theme around reimagining things and working with data. So it naturally evolved from just engineering into actually, I can do a ton of good stuff with this data. And that's how I sort of progressed. Well, I think the the dream has always been to build, be creative, and reframe and rethink problems. I think oh, if I, I was love that. pick a yeah. superpower, that's my superpower. I can think about things differently because I understand the potential of these technologies and data. So I can present people with a new set of options. So it's the creative and the building side combined is really the motivation. And that's what what makes me get up every morning. What have, what have the guys built since yesterday? I'm keen to see what's going on. What have we done? How have we progressed, right? So I'm really excited to get up in the mornings because I like doing those things, I guess. Oh, very nice. Uh, it, so did you, what did you start then immediately working with customers? What was the first job? How did you, yeah, how did so, you get into, yeah. Yeah, so I picked um, software engineering or software consulting or software houses as we called them back then. So people who actually build software. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a choice at some point, where do I go? Do I go down the route of hardware infrastructure or do I go the software route? And actually, when I when I learned to program in university, that was me done. I was like, this this is it. I can do this. I can nail this. This is my ambition. I can I can be creative in this space. And so yeah. that's really what set me off. It's just the idea that I can make things do other things by writing lines of code, right? And then if you modify a line of code, the screen goes this way and that way, like really simple stuff just fascinated me. So that's really how I got into it. Um, and yeah, that's it just grew from there, really. So working with software companies who specialized in building software for clients. So you get exposed to lots of different 
applications of software, different use cases, which you may not have, like logistics, right? Like you would imagine logistics companies have complex software. There's basic things that you go, oh, this is interesting. And then you sort of learn the trade. But I think sticking to software houses gave me a variety of new things coming in. So, mm -hmm. and then as I progressed in my career, I was always the one to say, oh, that's new, I'll go and do that. So I was always the one to say, oh, I don't know how that works, I'll go and do it. So I always exposed myself to lots of new things all the time. And as I've gotten older and more mature in my career, those things really pay dividends because you have this massive repertoire of experiences to pull from to then come up with new things. So the, the variety of what you get exposed to pays off, pays off quite well later in life when you have those experiences. So that was also a conscious choice not to work um, in industry. It was more to work with consulting companies that help other clients and so I've ended up in, if you look at my CV, ended up at companies like um, Cognizant. And I worked for Microsoft. You obviously, through the power of those companies, you get exposed to really large clients of your own. Um, the most formative time was when I worked in a small software company. I was bought by a management consulting company. And they sort of put the two things together very much in the style that I've done it now, which is the consulting and the technology delivery. So that was a really formative period, about five years, where I learned all these amazing skills from management consultants. And that's kind of where our company is basically on that, based on that model. So that was my sort of exposure, what got me excited. Then I learned these new skills, and oh, I can apply this. And then it just sort of mushroomed, really. But I think the variety of what you get exposed to is really valuable over time. Yeah, I, so a very common theme that I found in, in these interviews and in this podcast is it, it is a most definitely a journey of passion. So I, I love that, that that's indeed what you are following and, and it's, and it's staying true. Um, I also think that I love that you mentioned superpowers too. We, we often talk about superpowers here at data diversity and, you know, and really try and lean in was, okay, what's everybody's superpower? So we can lean into those and maximize those and, uh, and then find somebody with the superpowers that maybe we were lacking <laughs> to fill. So, yeah, really, yeah. It's a good so, skill to have. So it's it, good to know what you're good at, but it's probably more valuable knowing what you're not good at. I and agree. Just acknowledging that because then you can find compliments to your skills. And that's kind of what we do when I said, you know, at, at the top of the call, which is what do I do as architect in the team? We we literally do that. So we'll we'll hire someone and we'll find, okay, now the team is complete. Apart from this set of skills, then we'll do the next hire. But we never ever do is hire 15 people at once. Yeah. Because we want to see where the gaps are. Then once we put someone in, where's the gaps? And then we'll sort of iteratively build the team so we can keep building compliments around the core team and skills. So really valuable skill. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, we have also have often conversations about, you know, what do you not want to do? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what are you, where are you struggling so that we can yeah. fill those gaps, just like you're talking about. But I also heard, you know, along your journey that you're doing a lot, not only did you go to university, but you're continuing to learn and explore. And it sounds like some of it has a lot of been a lot of hands on learning just from yeah. your career path. But uh, how, how else do you keep engaged and up to date and on uh, the latest in information and data? Yeah, so. So, yeah, I think it's exposing yourself to people that sort of have maybe that sort of thread that you can then pull on and get to the details of it. So having that sort of stimuli coming in is really helpful. Mm -hmm. And the way I've done it, I, I spent a long time at Oxford now doing various things at Oxford, like executive education and exposing myself to that network, the alumni network. And then you end up, we have an, a couple of academics on our board, for example, who help us get new ideas around policy and government and all the rest of it. And then just networking, really. But it is about, again, exposing yourself to various new inputs, which you wouldn't get if you were just at your desk or working with your sort of close circle of people that you work with on a day-to-day -day basis, because we all think more or less about the same space, to actively stepping out of that and saying, where can I get new inputs? So we try to balance that with academic, which is kind of leading and maybe so far out that it's not going to be real tomorrow, but it gives you a glimpse of the future. Mm -hmm. And then also with industry to see where the trends are, what are people concerned about, what are the common themes when they discuss things. And then working with customers is the other thing. You know, customers, if you see the same problem two or three times, you know there's a trend there and you can then go and explore that trend. You can sort of see if we can get ahead of that. And then generally those things gives you a reason to respond. Those are challenges that you have to respond to. And then you use the same network to then say, well, 
how, how have some other customers done this maybe or what are the academics saying what's the future is there new technologies coming out all the rest of it um the other thing is you can see books are an incredible source of knowledge i think the one thing i would say is picking the quality of your content is key um mm -hmm. if you're going to read sort of the froth on the internet the stuff that bubbles to the top all the time you know what you find is quite diluted and very much the same thing but if you can get to the the nexus of that so can you find the academic paper that maybe sparked off that conversation read that because it's very dense and then you get a lot of information in a short space of time and then using that to branch out that's a really valuable skill i found and then the thing with books as well is if someone's written a book they've thought about it they've taken a long time to structure it organize it and there's two bits of value in a book i think for me personally is which is the structure of it because they've laid mm -hmm. out they've created a map of the world for you which is really valuable you can reuse the map or parts of it if you want to but then obviously the knowledge inside of it, the detail is also quite helpful. And then if you read enough books, you'll find recurring patterns as well. Um, which is interesting because then you'll see, well, everybody more or less looked at this problem the same. So there must be something there. So you can sort of see patterns across patterns, if you will. So that's the kind of way I do it. Um, and then, yeah, you know, look at LinkedIn. See, I don't read everything on LinkedIn, but see common patterns maybe. And everybody's talking about rags. What are they talking about? Let's follow through and see if there's something there. You see the same paper pop up four or five times in different feeds. You know there's something there. You go and read the paper. So yeah. just basically staying in touch with things and getting variety of input as well. I try not to do it myself to one source, but I do try and make sure it's quality, at least what I deem to be quality. So academic papers, books, well-respected authors, people in the field that I trust and go to conferences or can follow up on YouTube with if I wanted to. But just good quality sources really is the main thing because – if you're going to spend an hour doing something, you might want to find the best possible return on your investment for that hour. And if you're going to find some diluted content that's been recycled four or five times, it's probably not the best quality anymore because they lose density over time, I find. Where they start with academic paper would be really dense. And by the time you find it on YouTube, it's diluted quite a bit. So you won't find some happy medium that works for you, I guess. Very nice. So... That's some really good advice. And I love that you take the time to learn. It's so important. Um, you know, so many, and and I do it myself, you know, you know, you get so caught up and so busy that, you know, you, it's easy to let it slip, but it's so important to keep up and, and keep, and keep learning. So uh, do you, so tell me, Peter, what's been the biggest uh, lesson so far uh, in your career? Yeah, I think for me, um, so we, you know, we're a relatively small company and we've been through investment cycles and all the rest of it. And having dealt with businesses and trying to pitch to boards and things, I think the one thing I see time and time again is nobody really cares about data and technology. They care about, can you solve this problem for me better than anybody else can? Mm -hmm. They don't really want to know how you go off and do it. And so for me, the, the lesson I've learned also through my exposure with the management consultants and early in my career, sort of a five-year sprint working with them, is start with the business impact you want to create and link your skills to the impact, not mm. lead with your skills because people want to associate the problem that they are carrying around day to day that they maybe wake up with at three in the morning. They want to understand how you solve a problem for them. They don't, want, they don't want to care how you do it. They don't want to care that you're a specialist. Those are not important. Then you have to create that link for them. And if you can do that, that's a really important skill because that's how you get into larger contracts and people will start trusting you to deliver and you can expand. So I guess if I was to pick one thing, one skill to learn, it would be that one. Start with the business impact and link your skills to the outcome the other person wants. Um, people don't really care about specialisms that much. And it's interesting, and there is a peer group that do care about that, and you should be, that's table stakes, you should be really good at that. That's almost the assumption. But linking it to a real problem that someone else cares about is the, is the core skill. If you can't do that, your skills aren't valued enough. They're probably undervalued, or or, or you, you're probably working on something that isn't creating value. So it's one of those two things would be my sort of key takeaway. That's uh, it, not only a, an incredible lesson, but really good advice. We get asked all the time i mean not just for consultants but for from you know data practitioners you know asking how do i get our executives to on board to understand what we need to do or and that we need to do these things and how do i get them to understand this is important and i agree that you know starting with that business value going hey you're trying to achieve this but to do that <laughs> exactly. we need to start back here yeah i love it so 
More and more companies are considering investing in data literacy education, but still have questions about its value, purpose, and how to get the ball rolling. Introducing the newest monthly webinar series from Dataversity, Elevating Enterprise Data Literacy, where we discuss the landscape of data literacy and answer your burning questions. Learn more about this new series and register for free at dataversity.net. Um, having worked with data for most of your career, tell me, Peter, what, what is your definition of data? I'm not sure if it's going to be the one everybody wants to hear, but I'll tell you how I think about it. And then uh, I'll probably get some feedback on this one at some point. But it's basically, for me, it's a byproduct of processes, human activity. That's all it is. Um, and then you can say, well, what are these byproducts? Is there anything that's basically facts? There are things that happened in the past. There's evidence of it. It could be a PDF document with an image in it could be tabular data, but they are basically byproducts of human activity and increasingly so, right? So people don't even go on holiday without their phones and phones create data. So again, it's a byproduct of something you do and over time it just expands. So you can almost think of it as um, footprints in the sand because there's been activity and there were footprints. One set of footprints, you might go, mm, interesting. Thousands of them, you might see a trend and then you can reuse that. You might recycle that thing and then say, actually, I can show you where other people are and you can sell that advice. That's a very simple version of what data can do. So it's wherever there's human activity, um, there'll be byproducts, which is data, and they come in all shapes and sizes. I don't limit my definition to tabular data. I don't think that's correct. And actually we focus on unstructured because we think there's a big opportunity there. So, so that's how I would frame it. And then the potential then obviously is if you turn that around and you say, well, now I can see what human activity has produced let's say it's a process within a business, you can use that same byproducts to then make that process more efficient or create other products based on that. So that's kind of how I think about the world in terms of data, um, which is just a nice way to then link it back to some sort of other outcome you can build on top of that. Very nice. I, I love that definition. Um, so Peter, Tell me, do you see the importance then of data management and the number of jobs working with data increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years and why? Yeah, do I see it increasing or decreasing? That's a good question. I think there'll be more data, that's for sure. Um, I don't know that there'll be more people working on that. I don't know that I'm convinced about that. I think the technology is making lots of things easier over time. And so I think your skill set probably needs to move away from what used to be fairly technical in, in the past becomes commoditized. So I think there's an underlying trend with all of the stuff that what used to be a job 10 years ago is now done very efficiently to the point that no one actually knows it exists anymore. So I think there's this general trend of commoditization. So I think the skills, if I was to link it back to 21st century skills, which is my point above, which is really you should be able to explain how you can apply data to someone's problem and help them be efficient in solving that problem more effective. I think those skills are going to definitely increase. The ability to have mm -hmm. soft skills, critical thinking skills will increase in value as a complement to technical skills because more and more things become easier to do over time. So that would be my observation in terms of where it's generally going. So the value would accumulate at people that can apply these things to real problems because I think the world is becoming more complex. There are more options available to you. You have to make better choices as a byproduct, you have to move a lot quicker. So I think the ability to move quicker than everybody else and learn faster than everybody else, that's going to be a that's going to be an incredibly valuable skill. So I think those kinds of skills will increase over time. I don't know. I'm not quite sure there'd be more jobs. I don't know. Maybe there is. Maybe there isn't. I, don't, I haven't <laughs> thought about that one, which is a good point. Because yeah. in some way I can say, yes, there's more data, therefore there's more jobs. But then the counterfactual is a lot of things gets commoditized, gets automated right. all the time. And so... I think what, what's happening is the job today will move higher up the value chain, if I can explain it that way, more mm -hmm. to help other people who maybe aren't as initiated in data and its potential to A, see its potential and to help them realize the potential. I think that's going to be the core skill. And there'll be more of those because the demand will definitely go up. So how do I pick between the three options that I have? What's the best option? What's the trade-offs I have to make? I think those skills will become more valuable over time. I would absolutely agree. We're already seeing a demand for, you know, for lack of a better word, what are called soft skills, that communication yeah, exactly. um, style. So we are, you know, adding more and more of that because to meet that demand, it, it's very interesting. Um, yeah. So then what advice would you give people looking to get into a career in data management? 
I think just get started. Just go for it. It's simple as that. Um, you'd be yeah. surprised. You know, I, I, I follow this learn by doing with learn by doing approach uh, philosophy to some extent. Um, and you can't do something without learning, but you can't learn without doing. So it's a vicious cycle. And I think there's there's a place to to just sit and learn new things, but I think the best place to learn is forced learning, where you have to solve a problem, and the only way out of it is to learn new skills, because there's emotional resonance, and that that knowledge will stick with you, and experience teaches you far more than a book ever can. So I think just generally, if you can get into something, even if it's maybe not the level you want to be at, it's a level below, or it's maybe lots of levels below just get started because the sooner you get started, the more you're going to learn and the more you can expose yourself and the more you learn, you know, you can see more opportunities effectively. So I would say that's the key, the key thing in terms of um, how to get into the career. And then the, the theme I've obviously, you know, covered a few times, which is make sure you understand how to apply your skill in your trade to someone else's genuine problems. If you can do that, that's increasingly a valuable skill. And maybe it's a coordination role initially, and then by coordinating, you get exposed to new ideas, and then you might pick one of those up and say, I'm actually going to go into this field now. So exposing yourself and applying yourself would be the quickest way to get into it. And just if someone offers you a job, just take it. Just just make sure you, you're able to learn faster than anybody else and just go for it would be my... And sometimes you have to work for free. Like, I got started doing stuff for free. Like, I just said, like, I, it doesn't matter. This is interesting enough for me to get into it. I'm just, I just want to do the job, basically, because I want to learn how to do it. And then the next one was paid for. So, you know, you don't always have to put that as a barrier. Sometimes you just offer yourself up and say, I'm happy to volunteer or, or maybe do some part-time stuff. And actually see a lot of people having come in that way, which is they maybe have a full-time job, but then they work, they help the football club build like a, a regression model. And they go, oh, this is really interesting. And then that's the way they got into it. You know, so they just exposed themselves to the problem, threw themselves into it and just had to learn how to build regression models. And there you go, they started um so that would be my advice just get started and don't worry about failing that's the other thing you will fail more often than not the trick is to understand from a failure what can you learn from that because that's the key but that's where the learning happens when you fail you actually learn more than when you succeed because you haven't learned anything if you succeed really because you've applied something you already know and it's worked again but if you fail you have to figure out how to solve it that's where the learning happens so i think failure is very common and you have to accept that that's actually a good thing um not a bad thing so yeah just get started fail learn get on with it basically <laughs> oh such great advice really really good advice and and i i do you know i wish i had learned that so much earlier in my career to to you know avoid letting fear hold me back right for yeah. or you know Perfection is the enemy isn't it um, yeah. yeah there's a level of risk you have to take and i yeah. think the other thing is around uncertainty it's dealing knowing how to deal with uncertainty and finding a mechanism to accept that things are uncertain and just figure out a way to deal with it. And normally the way to do that is just do things in much smaller cycles and do it much quicker than anybody else. So yeah. that when you do fail, you didn't fail spectacularly. You fail, maybe you've lost a day's work or maybe you've lost a couple of hours worth of work or something really small you can recover from and just keep doing that all the time. You will outpace anybody else guaranteed if you can learn, learn from that experience. Absolutely. And it's comforting to know to talk about it, right? And that, you know, you're not alone in, you're not the only person on the planet who has failed at something, right? Well, it's not a, it's not, I'm not an isolated thing. Like, yeah. yeah so, it's it, definitely it's, built on failures. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's an important part yeah. of the process. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, Peter, this has been such a pleasure to sit down and chat with you. And I would be remiss if I didn't ask if somebody wanted to solicit uh, that your consulting services, how would they find you? Um, we're all northl.com. So that's the easy way to get into it. We're on LinkedIn. Um, that's easy. You can look up my name. I'm a pretty distinct um, name and surname. You'll find my website. There's, there's three ways to get into it. Um, happy for people to reach out for advice, new ideas. Like I just love, I love a good conversation because, like I said, I expose myself to as many things as possible. So, even if you may not want to use our services, you may just want to ask something, or you just have an idea. Those are all welcome. Um, yeah, so easy to find basically either by my distinct name or by the company name. It's on .com, so you should be able to find us. Um, yeah, that's that's fantastic. It. Yeah, and we'll we'll list those links on the podcast website as well. And uh, is your where's your book available? Uh, books available all the major places, primarily Amazon. Um, and what I found out is a lot of people read it on Kindle, 
We are working on the audio version, which okay. everybody is asking for, because what I also figured out, learning experience is people love books, but they want to take them on the go and they want to sit in the train and yeah. read them. So yeah. we're working on the audio version, which should be available soon enough. Um, and it's meant to really be a train ride read. So it's a, it's an easy, comfortable read. You don't have to stress yourself out too much and get pen and paper out to follow along. So yeah, Amazon is the main place um, and then Audible soon enough. Perfect. Thank you. And just to, for everybody, just a reminder, the book, the title of the book is AI for Business. So, and we'll get links to that as well. Well, Peter, again, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us. Brilliant. Thank you, Shannon. Really appreciate that. And like I say, just get started. <laughs> I love it. Well, and to all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to keep up to date on the latest podcast and the latest in data management education, you can go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Until next time, stay curious, everyone. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks, a podcast brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe.